Uh, it looks like we have most of the people here. I think we're missing just one more, but I'll start bringing them in uh, right now. Uh, first, uh, we have Bobby Sylvester. Bobby Sylvester, you might, hey, guys man. might not know him. You should. Bobby Sylvester is the host of the Fantasy Pros Baseball Podcast, as well as a fantasy analyst for Fantasy Pros, where he covers fantasy baseball, football, and basketball. You can find him on Twitter at Bobby Fantasy Pro. What's up, Bobby? How you doing? I'm doing great. Rocking my uh, Red Sox jersey right now. I'm a Cardinals fan. I'm wearing the Cardinals shirt underneath, but I don't know why. I just threw on the Red Sox jersey today. <laughs> That's awesome. Is this? Okay, so um, I've been very lucky. You've been very nice to, to bring me on the Fantasy Pros podcast. Is this? I, I, I don't get to see you during that. Is this sure. what I would be seeing if you were for doing that? Typically, yeah. Um, so I'm sitting down in my basement right now, and uh, it's a little bit, you know, you can see right around – Usually I crop this out and you can see right around like the backdrop and everything, but well, um, I don't know if yeah. you saw Alex fast last night. He's in his parents' basement with boxes behind him. Like it's awesome. an Amazon warehouse. So don't you worry. <laughs> You've got you beat. Um, all right. Next I'm going to bring on Mike Gianella. Mike has been writing about fancy baseball since 2007 and writing about it for baseball prospectus since 2013. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mike Gianella. Mike, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for having me. This is really ex exciting. I've been looking forward to this all week. Yeah, it's, it's it's crazy to see how many people, I mean, you guys included, thank you so much for being so generous to uh, to support PitchCon and what we're doing here. Uh, and it's cool just to see you guys again. Uh, it's, it's been a little bit. Um, we also have Craig Edwards here. Craig Edwards is a writer over at Fangraphs, where he's recently written about the recent struggles between the league and the players' union, including a fantastic piece breaking down the economics of MLB's latest proposal to the players. You can follow him on Twitter at Craig J. Edwards, and you might also know him from being uh, the former head of the Viva Alberto's site. Welcome, Craig. Also another St. Louis Cardinals fan, clearly. Yeah, but I'm wearing the shirt outside. Uh, I'm not covering <laughs> it up with the Red Sox shirt. <laughs> Uh, so we also have uh, Steve Garner um, coming shortly. Uh, I imagine there is, there's some hiccup there, but we can kind of get started in trying to understand um, just the history of everyone here. I went over a little bit about uh, you know where you guys are writing now, but I want to kind of hear how you got your start. So starting with Bobby, what was the um, the first place that you uh, you wrote about baseball? Yeah, the first place I wrote about baseball was with Fantasy Pros. I'm very much unlike anybody else in the industry. You keep hearing about all these guys who were just grinding for years and years, writing for free. It just kind of fell into my lap. I got super lucky. So I was doing a, uh, a fantasy football draft um, startup app. I was designing the algorithms for that. I'm a big numbers guy, uh, which obviously goes really well with baseball. Baseball is my number one sport. Also do football and basketball, as you mentioned. But um, I was working for them, and I saw the uh, the opening for a data scientist at Fantasy Pros. And I was like, uh, what, what do I have to lose? I'll hmm. apply for this. I've got like a one in a thousand chance. And uh, they gave me a shot and they said, hey, we want to put you on a podcast and see how it goes. And I was like, dude, that's not for me. I'm way in over my head. I'm super like in-person introverted. Don't like talking to people, live out in the woods. Nobody even <laughs> knows I exist. And, uh, you know, just kind of find my calling. Absolutely love it. Nice. Uh, well, and uh, and what, we, what was the first article that you did write at Fantasy Pros? Sure. So the first article I ever wrote was uh, my annual prospects article where I write top 500 prospects and um, you know, it's not exactly how does this apply to real MLB, but from a fantasy perspective, we're fantasy pros, right? And so I talked about the differences in um, in most websites, prospect rankings and mine because they apply to uh, fantasy. Nice. Uh, so, so Mike, uh, tell us a little about, uh, about your story. You started in 2007. How did that come to be? Did we lose Mike? Uh, we might have we might have lost Mike. I uh, Craig, uh, tell us about your tale. Um, the actually the the first thing that I ever got published was at Fangraphs, but it was back in like 2010, maybe. Um, it was it was on the community blog. I just submitted it, and then uh, it was on Adam Wainwright. Um, he had started. I think he'd started using his curveball more. Um, and it was going back to um, the percentages that were closer to when he was a reliever and he started pitching a lot better. And so that's, that's what I wrote about. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, like a, a one shot deal or whatever. And then I, I think that I, I did maybe one other 
community post at, at Fangraphs uh, maybe a, a year or two after that, and then wrote for uh, the Yankees website for on, on uh, SB Nation for a year uh, before going to Viva Albertos, which eventually brought me back to uh, to Fangraphs. Nice, and uh, and so that, that was your very first article. Did you were you nervous at all about it? I mean, uh, did you just kind of submit it and go whatever, just take this? Yes, uh, it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, it, you're you're just submitting something out into the world, and you know, at the time, like you know, I'm not um, super. I was probably like you know, I was in my late twenties at the time, so it's not like you know, I I wasn't. I was completely, you know, I was. I wasn't like a high schooler submitting something, but I also have no idea, you know, what anybody is going to think about, about what my writing is because right. there's not really any other avenue, you know, to, to go to go for. It's crazy to think about even, you know, 10 years ago that the internet and baseball writing is, is different uh, than today. Definitely. Um, so we have Mike Beck. We also have Steve Gardner and Steve Gardner, it's great to have you here. Steve is the senior fantasy editor for USA Today Sports. Steve Garner has covered 18 World Series, a Super Bowl, and has won 14 Fantasy Experts League titles. He's a member of the Baseball nice. Writers Association of America, and can be found on Twitter at Steve A. Gardner. Steve, thanks so much for coming by here at PitchCon. Hey, Nick. Appreciate the uh, the invite. Quite a group we have here. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm so happy that you can make it. Um, so we're going around talking about the uh, the first uh, the first place where you wrote and what was the first article you had, uh, Mike, you just cut out there uh, while you were getting to you. Uh, what is your story? And unfortunately, it looks like he, uh, Steve, <laughs> what is your story? Well, um, I was a broadcasting major in college. And so I was in radio for uh, several years right out of school um, and went through local radio and somehow or another USA Today was starting up a, a news by telephone service. And that's how, you know, that was my big break. I knew somebody that I'd worked with before was with this group. And so I, uh, I went, we recorded essentially news stories uh, that people could access by their phones back in the early days, um, really even before the internet got, uh, got going. And I hooked up with USA Today back then in 1983. Wow. And um, believe it or not, and usatoday.com, you know, when that little uh, venture folded, usatoday.com uh, sprung up and uh, I joined them and started writing. I was uh, writing baseball, editing baseball stories and things like that on the web before I even got into fantasy. So um, I've been you know, covering sports for a long time, but in terms of, of writing about fantasy sports, I really, I, I think my big break was when John Hunt left uh, Baseball Weekly. He was the fantasy, you know, the original fantasy columnist there, uh, and they needed somebody to take over, and that was where, you know, I was just, well, I'm here. And they said you can write about baseball. I've been writing columns and things like that for the website, but uh, that was something completely different, and uh, that's where I kind of got a, a hold in the uh the fantasy realm and i've still been able to manage to do to do both real baseball and fantasy baseball since then and uh gosh 2006 i guess wow so yeah 2006 then you came into that role how i mean with your perspective of course how do you think that it's changed a bit like how we talk about fantasy sports on the internet and what were the kind of pieces that you were expected to write back then well, it's interesting that um, back when Baseball Weekly started, I mean, that was a way to basically get box scores. And for folks who've been playing fantasy baseball for a long time, I mean, that was the way that you scored your leagues yeah. is you got yeah. the Baseball Weekly on Wednesdays and it had all the stats from the previous week and you did them by hand. And uh, the interesting thing is that's how Baseball Weekly started up because it was a way for, you know, not only people who liked baseball, but wanted to explore the fantasy uh, realm of things. And it was a taboo. It was really taboo to say fantasy. Mm -hmm. Whenever we were writing, whenever it's, anything was written in there, it was pretty much understood when you're talking about prospects or you know job position battles in spring training. That's stuff that fantasy people were really, really latching onto and was available in Baseball Weekly. But you never said fantasy because that turned off such a huge... A segment of the population. And uh, I think one of the big changes now is that 
you can say fantasy and it is much more accepted. You know, we have fantasy TV shows. Now you see fantasy stats at the bottom of your NFL games, you know, throughout the day. Um, and I think that's where fantasy has become much more mainstream than, uh, than it was when I started when it was pretty much maybe underground is, is a uh, more of an app description. Right. So I, uh, so I think we got Mike here, Mike, how you doing there? Mike, can you hear us? Maybe not. Uh, by the way, Craig, I love the mug that you have. Um, are they back in stock currently at Fangraphs? Yeah, you can order them again. Oh, so. that's wonderful. Obviously, go and support Fangraphs if you can. Uh, so I, I wanted to, uh, if we have Mike, Mike, at any point, if you can hear us, just chime in. Uh, we'll love to get you in on the conversation here. So uh, I want to kind of, I had some prepared questions, everything. I kind of want to bounce around with it. I want to start with something really fun. I so, uh, so Craig, what is the, the article that you look back on? Like, yeah, that is, that's my favorite article that I've written. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, it's, it, it's like a, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, like back, if I look back with, at Viva Alberto's, uh, you know, I wrote like a really long one on Tony La Russa. I think one that I was really proud of was like one on, um, Yadier Molina and how he performed on, on days of rest. And then, um, the one that definitely got, uh, I don't know, read the most was that the Cardinals should fire Mike Matheny. And, you know, yeah. I still, that's, it's such a negative thing to, 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 to think about, but, you know, back from Viva Alberto's, that's, that's the one article that like, I felt like I really nailed it. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, in terms of, of fan graphs, um, you know, I, I think that, there's not necessarily like it's really really hard to pick um you know a, a favorite piece i think that um you know it's the the research um you know that that is involved in a lot of things is is more fun for me than necessarily yeah. writing it up you know yeah. um you know when the, the the most recent like really big project that that i i, I think that um before this before last year was was trying to just redo um you know what exactly a, a prospect is worth and it took a really long time to to do and and it was a, a ton of effort but i was i was really happy with uh you know the work that i did and um you don't always get a good reception from from things but uh, i was also very pleased with with how it was received Nice. Yeah, that's great. And then what about you, Bobby? Yeah, it's really interesting hearing Craig talk about writing these articles because as a Cardinals fan, I'm always on the site. I'm always reading all these articles. I read them all. And, uh, you know, while I disagreed about the Matheny one, uh, I think that the way that you worded it, that really helped me understand the other side, Craig. And uh, it's just fun to hear you talk about it. But um, for me, my favorite article I've ever written is actually a college basketball article. Uh, hmm. maximizing your brackets investment. However, if we're going to be talking about baseball, uh, which we're clearly doing here, it would be my Marmol strategy article is one of the first ones that I came out with. And it's something that I've been doing in fantasy baseball where leagues allow it um, since I was, I don't know, 15, 16 years old. And it's just kind of a cheat code um, because a lot of these leagues do not require you to have an innings minimum. If you don't have to get 20 innings, what does it matter if you just spend all your draft capital on, on hitters. And then you go get these cheap relievers who are going to pile up the saves ERA and whip. Then you win eight out of 10 categories. That's a league winner. Right. And so uh, just go, being able to go out and explain the math to people and have a platform to do it. And then that was the first article where I really got a big reception. Um, and, and still year in and year out, people are always asking, Hey, when's the 2020 version of Marmol strategy coming out? It's kind of like my baby. And uh, it's my favorite article. Oh, great. And what about you, Steve? Um, I, I think what I like um, is to be able to combine a lot of the, the, you know, the journalistic reporting things and some of the analytic things together. And um, what I've been able to do a, a handful of times with uh, the USA Today Sports Weekly again is to write not only a fantasy column in the, the big uh, fantasy issue that we have, but also kind of like a cover story 
that blends maybe a, a topic that's in the news at that particular time. Um, the one that I really liked the most, I think worked out the best, was one just to talk about some of the, you know, this was several years ago, but some of the new analytics that were uh, involved in baseball and to help analyze baseball and talking to some of the players and kind of, you know, describing what they're thinking when they're thinking and talking about launch angles and things like that. Right. Um, that was one of those that I got to report in spring training in Florida and Arizona uh, and talk to different players in, in both locations and then combine that into a story that would appeal to the baseball fan and also to the fantasy fan. So uh, I think those those kinds of stories um, were the ones that I liked the most. Yeah, those are great, right? Because we talk about it all from the numbers or just we're just so removed from the game, essentially. And hearing it from actual players that, okay, we understand this, that's too, but do they really truly understand it and actually understand that perspective of what they're going through actually? Okay, here's my launch angle right now. Should I be maybe changing it slightly as the ball comes in or not? Yeah, you know, it was one of those. It was one of those. The year that remember Ryan Zimmerman had that high exit velocity but low <laughs> launch angle, and in talking to Daniel Murphy, who was a big launch angle proponent, talking mm -hmm. about you know if, if Zimmerman can just get his launch angle up a little bit higher, I think he can have a really big year. And sure enough, that's you know exactly what happened to him. Um, had a great year several years ago. So great. Uh, so that, those are the breakthroughs that we we love to yeah. to have and and yeah. and write about. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to do with this uh, panel here, uh, bring all these fantastic minds, of course, together, uh, is helping those that are just jumping into the industry. Um, yeah. I mean, it's very imposing right now. There are uh, there's so many incredible outlets out there, so many great people talking about the sport. And a lot of people, I'm sure, don't really know how to get started and to jump into it. So, uh, so I wanted to kind of illuminate what that process is like for you guys, guys that are they're obviously experts and veterans in the field, and how you would guide someone that is just getting started, how you would help them, of course, try their best to, of course, progress in the field. So uh, starting with you, Craig, uh, what, yeah, what advice would you give someone who's just jumping into the industry today? You know, I think that, you know, some of the things are obvious, you know, read a ton, uh, write a ton. Um, those are the most important things because, you know, writing a lot is going to help you technically. It's going to help you, you know, increase your vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera. And the same with reading and and reading also is going to help you make sure that you're paying attention to everything that, that's going on because, you know, it really changes very quickly, um, you know, from year to year with all the different, you know, stat casts and everything that's coming out. You know, if you're writing about the game the same way you were five years ago, you're, you're going to be behind. And so it's important to read what everybody else is writing so that you stay on top of things. And, and just from a general writing perspective, I, I think I find it, it's important to sort of try to have one sort of side uh, project where you know, it's maybe a little bit bigger uh, in scope than what you're working on, but make sure that you're constantly doing sort of the daily uh, work to sort of make sure you're, you're keeping things sharp. I think that one thing when you're starting out, uh, you want to, you feel like a lot of pressure to sort of make your like one big thing or make sure that what you have is exactly perfect. And then you end up just putting things off and putting things off and putting things off. And, and what it's more important to just keep writing and get all of your ideas out as, as quickly as you can while still working on maybe that, that bigger thing that, that you're hoping that, that really turns into something. Definitely. I think those, those are excellent points. Yeah. Um, and uh, I remember actually talking to Mike Gianella uh, four years ago and actually asking him what would he do this. And I remember his answer then. And hopefully he can come back and, and give his answer uh, now as well. But I remember it being just write every single day. Um, you wake up, write, write, and then write some more and then continuously do that, um, which obviously builds right along with what you were saying there, Craig. Uh, going to you, Bobby, what would you suggest? Uh, you just got to start doing today? it. Uh, everyone, you know, everyone that I talk to uh, who writes these emails and asks me, man, how do I get in? How do I get my foot in the door? And I was wondering the same thing here five years ago, right? How do I do it? You just got to start doing it. Just just start writing. Just start doing your rankings. Uh, make a podcast, even if it's just for your dumb little 12 team fantasy league and your friends and nobody's listening to it. Just get the reps in and eventually you'll get better. And if you're good enough, you'll get noticed. You have to have that experience somewhere if you want uh, to have your foot in the door where you're getting paid to write or even if you're able, able to do it full time. And so I would just recommend doing it. Now we've got programs like this that 
will help people get their foot in the door, f- find out if they, you know, like the taste for it. Uh, it's called the Fantasy Pros News Desk. We have a team of 250 correspondents who are continually writing notes, uh, updating based on what happened recently for fantasy. And uh, and when they showcase that they're doing a competent job, hey, we'll let them write, um, you know, long form, short form articles. Um, and several of these guys have gone into work full time in the industry. So it's a cool program. Uh, you can apply at fantasypros.com. And um, hopefully you guys are able to live the dream like me. I remember the day that I found out that I was going to get to live my dream. I don't know if there was a more exciting day in my life. You know, it, it, it's awesome. I'm still pinching myself every day, five years later. So was, was that just like an email that was just sent to you one day? What's that? That I was going to work full time? Yeah. Oh, well, no, I applied for the job and I went through uh, three interviews and mm-hmm. um, I don't know. When I got to the second interview, I was like, why are they talking to me? Like, I'm <laughs> sure that there's better applicants out there. When I got to the third one, I was like, wow, this is seriously a possibility. I cannot believe I'm in the running for this. And when I found out, like, I was so giddy, man. I was so pumped up. I was bouncing off the walls. Hmm, that's Still awesome. <laughs> that's a great, that's such a great feeling. All right. And Steve, yeah, what uh, what advice would you give anyone? Well, um, the the industry has changed considerably since I j- broke into the business of, of of sports and sports writing. But the one thing I think that is has remained kind of constant is you always need to be able to learn new things, do mm. new things, be able to have a variety of skills. I mean, I, I think. You know, the best advice I could give somebody that wants to break into the business is be able to do a lot of things, be good at a lot of things, but then specialize, excel in one thing or try and find what you are really, really good at. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps because so many, I mean, my job has changed so many different times, even just with USA Today itself. My job has changed any number of times, and just being able to, you know, to trans, uh, you know, transfer between writing a lot for print and then you know, writing for the internet or podcasting or doing any number of different things along those lines, mixing them all together, I think I've been able to try and 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 be okay at all of these different things, but opening the door up to the things that I really want to do. And um, I think that's the the best advice that I could give to somebody that really wants to break into the business is is ha- have lots of skills, but then when you get your opportunity to focus on something that you're really good at and and be the best that you can be in that regard, and and that's where you're going to shine, and most likely that's where people will see your talent. Nick, that's can good I advice. Back onto that really quick. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, I think that. I totally agree with everything that um, that Steve just said. I will add on that if you are able to write about football as well, like I just said, baseball is by far my favorite sport, but mm-hmm. the money is with football, right? 70 to 80% of the industry, um, the money is, is with football. And if you can write about football as well, then, hey, guess what? You might be able to write about baseball. Um, and a lot of other people just can't have that opportunity because they only do one sport now. You guys obviously really excel about talking about baseball, so you were able to do it. But I don't know if I could have pulled it off. If I would have grinded for five, six years, writing for free by myself, um, football was kind of my foot in the door. Well, okay. First of all, how dare you uh, talk <laughs> about football right now? Uh, <laughs> no, but that is, that is fantastic advice and really does build upon what Steve is saying about being a bit of a Swiss Army knife. Sure. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it means a lot to hear that. Obviously, I, I'm not you know on the same level as you veterans. I uh, nevertheless, I just only talk about starting pitching. I talk about baseball and then not even just all pitching, but just starting pitching. And that's the only thing that I do. Um, and, and I pretty well too, Nick, <laughs> yeah. you uh, to that. To say that. but I, but I mean, and, and a little more on that too, is uh, I, I think it's, it's something important, at least for me, when I'm looking at people that I want to bring onto the team is I want to read something that is not about the information. Right. Like I want to be entertained as I read it. I want to I want to have a conversation with the person. I want to read it and be like, oh, cool. I think I would get along with this person. I don't want to read like a textbook or something. I mean, this for honestly, for you guys, I imagine it's obvious. Be a good writer. But uh, it's uh, at the same time, how you're supposed to write is uh, is something that I, I see a lot of people kind of stumble over and they don't realize that, you know, coming straight out of college, we have to write all these APA uh, graded things and you know stick that specific format it's not like that it's actually you're supposed to write something that you would want to read as opposed to handing in a term paper 
or something along those lines. So I would definitely suggest anyone listening to to try to be as, hey, uh, you know, talk it out with us, with us and have some sort of life to it that isn't just he had a batting average of 320 and he hit 30 home runs. And I think that he's going to be good this year. And yeah, I think it's re- it's really important to to find your own voice. I think that it's very easy to sort of read other people and maybe try to copy their style. And I think that reading them a lot is probably going to insert some of their style into your own writing. But at the same time, it's very important that that you you're having the conversation. You're not trying to have a conversation that someone else is having. I agree with that 100%. And something I always tell the new writers at Fantasy Pros is, dude, just write the article that you want to read. You know, give the podcast that you want to listen to. That's what's going to make it good, right? Yeah, exactly. you, you need to be you need to be really curious and answer the questions that you have thought of. I think that, yeah. that then that that's really going to come across that that you're interested in it. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I'm, I thought for a moment we had Mike back. Unfortunately, it looks like it's still a little bit tough, uh, tough for him. Uh, but a building on that, so uh, so for example, when you said emulate someone, I mean, I cannot say enough that I I certainly took people in the industry with some that come to mind is I just read Jeff Sullivan and just go, I just want to be him forever. Uh, but I, and, and it's hard not to, especially beginning to try and think, okay, what do I like about him and try and emulate that? For you guys, uh, who were some writers that you really took inspiration from early? I'll start here with Steve. Wow. Um, I, I think, first of all, in terms of writing about fantasy, uh, John Hunt, Fantasy Sports Writers Hall of Famer, um, is, is a pretty good model. I mean, he he did a lot of things to, um, to set the industry on, on the course that it, it was at the beginning of that. Um, I think, you know, there are so many good writers out there now, though. That's that's the crazy thing. And um, I what I try and do is um, I try and and take some things from everybody, but make them, as, as you guys have said before, make them my own. I mean, I look at people who I like to read and it, not necessarily in the fantasy realm. Um, you know, Tony Kornheiser, back when I was growing up, was... Uh, an amazing columnist who wrote sports. He wrote lifestyle columns. He did all sorts of things. And just the way that he wrote, again, talking like uh, you're, you're, you're having a conversation with somebody and he was funny. He was, uh, he got his point across. Sometimes he was subtle. And I think those are kind of the elements that, that when I'm writing a column or trying to write a column, I like to put those elements in there as well. You know, have a point, make a point, you know, throw some some interesting facts in there, but do it in a, a conversational, sometimes a humorous way, and and leave somebody with the, something at the end that they can take away. And I think that's that's the style that that I've tried to develop. And uh, it's honestly, it's a mixture of so many different people that uh, that I've read through over the years. Hmm. So so on that actually, um, this might be an interesting way of putting it. I have you ever times when you're thinking when you're writing, like, okay, maybe I should go for this thing or not. And I, and if you have, have you found that it's either, is that a good thing to actually go for and do that? Or is it actually detrimental? Well, it it helps to have a good editor. And I think we all can certainly uh, (laughs) subscribe to that. Um, Because a lot of times I have ideas that go, you know, beyond where they need to be. And when I submit it and my editor will say, you know, uh, maybe this doesn't work so well. You sure. can try something different. Um, so I think that's very important. And gosh, you guys I, I, and I and everybody out there that's that's uh, that's watching this too. Editing is such a huge mm. part of the writing process, and you need a good editor. Um, I think my worst, the biggest problem that I have is that I think. I'm a better editor than I'm a writer. And I try and edit mm-hmm. myself before it even gets to the stage where I can turn it in and it takes forever. And um, so the whole point of, of, I think writing is a process and editing is a process. And if you yeah. don't have to do both, that's great <laughs> because uh, it certainly helps the process speed along. But if, uh, if you're trying to do both, you can get bogged down in it. When I started full time at Fantasy Pros, before they even let me write an article, I mean, they they'd seen me write articles for for another site previously about fantasy football. But before I wrote any articles, they wanted me to edit a bunch of articles because um, they thought that that would grow me as a writer more. And and I agree. I think I grew more as a writer in those two months 
than in the previous, you know, five years of my life. Um, hmm. If you can find a way to edit some articles, it's going to help you out a ton as a writer. That's great. So, uh, so Craig, so who would you say that you took inspiration uh, from when you started writing? You know, um, I, you know, I'm very lucky because like all I've wanted to do for a really long time is write for fan graphs and hmm. that's now what I do. So, I mean, yeah. I, you know, like Dave Cameron, Jeff Sullivan, and, you know, back when Jeff and uh, Grant Brisby and Rob Nyer were at the SB Nation, those were, were people that, that I read all the time. And, um, you know, going back to, you know, Steve's uh, Tony Kornheiser um, mention, I'd say somebody for me uh, who's sort of outside of baseball, but uh, I used to love reading Dr. Z in Sports Illustrated. And okay. he was he was a guy who really just dug into the numbers and then presented them away in a way that was, you know, helpful to understand. And, and uh, you could just, you could tell his love and appreciation for the sport. And, um, you know, the, there are, there's not, that, that was something that was very difficult to do back when, back when he was doing it. And back, back as a kid, just reading Sports Illustrated every week, that was, that was a big influence for me. That's great. And, uh, and Bobby, how about you? I started reading Bill James baseball abstracts when I was eight years old, when all the other kids were out climbing in trees and playing sports and chasing girls. I was sitting there with my nose in a book reading Bill James and I read everything Bill James. He's like my spirit animal, uh, him and a mix of Gardner Minshew. But um, outside of baseball and Bill James, like Bill James is the oh, big get one. Out of here. I read it. a ton of Thomas Sowell, uh, R.C. Sproul, Nassim Tlaib. Um, those are big inspirations for me as well. I'll tell you one other thing too, Nick, if I can yeah. drop two more names. Um, of of contemporary people who are writing now, um, Joe Sheehan and Will Leach are fabulous reads. Hmm. Anything they read, anything they write, I will definitely read. And, and most of the time, 99% uh, of the time will make me think and challenge some mm -hmm. of my own beliefs. So if, you know, if, if people are able to, uh, to find stuff that those guys write, they are fantastic. And I, uh, I can't say enough good things about those guys. Yeah. Don't hesitate to shout out anyone that you appreciate in the industry. I mean, that's, that's part of the, what this is about too. Uh, and going into that, really, uh, I feel like this is a good way to talk about how you guys got your first break and who really was that person that said, okay, you know what, we're going to put our faith in Craig Edwards here. Uh, who was that for you, Craig? Um, you know, it's it, it's it's difficult to say. I think uh, you know the you know whoever was reading the community blog post back at back at Fangraphs in 2010. I mean, that was that was important for me. Um, it was uh, uh, Steve Goldman and uh, Tanya Bondurant um, who were at the Yankees blog, and then. Um, uh, Justin Bopp was the guy at SB Nation who brought me over to to Viva Albertos, and you know it's 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 sort of a progression. But uh, I mean, you know, I, David Appleman and Dave Cameron were the people that that first gave me a shot at, at FanGraphs as a as a contributor when um, you know I had done a lot of blogging for the Cardinals, but uh, you know it I hadn't really branched out you know too much too much beyond that and. Um, them giving me the opportunity to write part time there. Um, I mean that it, it really just just set me forward, and um, fortunately, I still get to work for for David Appleman. Nice, yeah. I remember actually. I think um, I think I, I got well. I got to meet you uh, in 2018. I remember meeting you at the Coors game during the Fangraphs meetup, uh, and I think that was your first year. That if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, right? as, uh, full time, right? Yes. Yeah, um, I think uh, it was. I've been. It's 2015 was when I first started writing uh, part time at Fangraphs. Cool, awesome. Uh, how about you, Bobby? Yeah, there's two names that immediately come to mind. Uh, the first one is Matt DeCreeble. He's the one who created that uh, website, the Draft Night, where we were building a a fantasy football draft app and. Uh, he just said, dude, write whatever you want on the website, mm -hmm. write as many articles as you want. And I just had a heyday with it. I was having so much fun. And uh, that's what got me recognized for Fantasy Pros is, is my writing over on that site. So I'm really grateful for that opportunity. And then the guy who uh, used to be the chief editor of Fantasy Pros, now he just does a ton of other stuff for Fantasy Pros and Betting Pros. His name is Blaine Blonts, and he's also my best friend in the company. We've got a bunch of full-time employees, and he is awesome. I love uh, Blaine and same kind of thing when I got there. He just gave me complete creative freedom. Write whatever you want. We hired you for a reason. We trust you. 
um, just have fun with it. And uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful for that. No, that's fantastic. And Steve, I imagine it might have to do with, with Hunt, but I'm just going to yep. still Indeed. throw it away. Indeed. Um, it, when John gave me uh, the first opportunity to participate in labor, you know, that was mm -hmm. a huge thing for me because joining that group of, of uh, such you know, mountaintop, you know, Mount Rushmore type uh, fantasy analysts was was amazing exposure to me. Um, Ron Chandler, I think uh, I have to, to credit him as well, yeah. just for being an inspiration and in helping me to learn this entire uh, you know fantasy business and 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 mm -hmm. what goes on and how to how to actually look at fantasy and stats and things like that. Um, I think we as an industry owe him a, a huge debt of gratitude. And then just the people that have, have given me a chance um, at USA Today, my editors, uh, Chad Zarniak and uh, Gary Kaczynski, names that probably don't uh, register with anybody other than the folks at USA Today, but they've uh, allowed me to kind of branch out and do any number of different things and um, and see what I can and, and can't do. And, and I'm still here doing some of them. Hmm. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned Ron Chandler too, because uh, I know he's not on the uh, the schedule right now, but actually I got word the other day that he's going to join the Baseball HQ crew for the PitchCon presentation about the baseball forecaster. So I'm really excited to have him part of this. He's an uh, awesome one, isn't he? Absolute legend, of course, Ron Chandler. So I'm yeah. really excited to have him here at PitchCon. And uh, really quickly, obviously not on the same level as you guys, but I have to mention uh, Paul Spore for just reaching out to me on Twitter saying, hey, do you want to write for Rotographs, which obviously was a major thing for me. Uh, and... Actually, in 2014, actually, when I was doing pitcher gifts, uh, Neil Greenberg of the Washington Post gave me an opportunity to write there uh, with fancy stats, uh, which actually allowed me to get one article inside the paper, which is something that I never thought I'd be able to do. And I had no right to after about like a year and a half of just doing this. I did not deserve it, but whatever that happened. So huge thanks to you, Neil, for giving me that opportunity. Yay, print. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so uh, so going more back into uh, the process of writing, um, I'm curious what everyone's routine is. Uh, like for example, for me, if I'm doing a long form, you know, like a going deep piece or just about 1,500 words or maybe longer, maybe 3,000 because I know I ramble about one guy. What I physically do is I get out of here, I go into my kitchen, and I articulate and say it out loud and pace. Once I kind of know what I'm going to do, I do all my research about stuff and I just say it out loud. And then I come back here and pretty much write down all those thoughts, which I know is not typical. So I'm kind of curious <laughs> what your processes are and how these articles come about. Bobby, we'll start with you. Yeah, it's uh, definitely nothing quite like that. It's um, <laughs> what, what I really like to do is I like to just do my research and then decide what I'm going to write about mm -hmm. um, just based on whatever comes up. Like right now I'm writing an article about Ryan Tannehill having a shot to win the NFL MVP. And I'm having a lot of fun doing it, but that's just because I was doing some research and I noticed some really ridiculous statistics that, um, you know, seemed to indicate that he it was a possibility. Um, and so what I do then is I just build the skeleton of my article, um, you know, the, the headlines that I really want to hit on, the main points. And then I'll go back, I don't know, three, four days later, I'll build like, I don't know, four or five skeletons in a row. And then I'll go back when I'm really in the mood to write. Cause you just got it. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you guys are just full time gung ho about writing. I do the podcasts and algorithms and stuff like that. Writing, I got to be in the mood. And then I'll just write three or four. I'll finish the three or four articles all in one day, um, rather than doing the skeletons, which take a lot of time. Hmm. Uh, and uh, and also about like the actual process of writing. Is it? I mean, you're saying you're, you're a guy that does it very much so in bursts. Is it with music or anything? Are you completely silent? Uh, what is your whole like battle station for writing, or is it just you on a laptop? Got to be silent, man. Yeah, got to be silent. Can't do it. Fair enough. Uh, how about you, Craig? Um, you know, I, it it depends on the, the type of, of article I'm doing. You know, a lot of it's just going to be reacting to the news um, in terms of, you know, figuring out, like, what's going on and, and why it's happening. But, you know, in season, which we hopefully get at some point um, in the next six weeks or so, um, you know, I'll wake up and maybe just mess around on the leaderboards for a little bit, find something unusual and and then try to explain it. Um, and in terms of, of you know, process, uh, you know, I'm if if I'm, you know, honestly, sometimes I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I think about baseball. And, and then when that happens, I don't want to get out of bed. 
But what I may end up doing is, you know, repeating sort of uh, a paragraph in my head, you know, over and over to help me get back to sleep a little bit. And, and th then, you know, when I wake up, it's still sort of in there somewhere, you know, and, but, uh, yeah, I, I have an office in, in the back of our house. Um, I've tried to write with TV on in the background and I just can't do it. Um, you know, I sometimes, you know, I'll open the windows for some, you know, ambient outdoor noise, but, uh, usually I'm just, just sitting at my desk and, and just, uh, once I figure out what's going on, I, I just, I just start writing. And how about you, Steve? It's funny what Craig just said. I had that happen last night where I thought of something. I was lying in bed and I actually did get up, go downstairs, boot my computer up and put those thoughts down so I wouldn't forget them. Um, <laughs> for me, I, I, it's two parts. Um, number one is coming up with a good idea. That's, that's one half of it. The <laughs> other half is actually the writing process. And both to me are, are equally difficult. Um, and I think I need, because of all the distractions that are going on all the time, I need a space where I can come up with an idea and I don't have anything else going on. And the only place that I have that in the entire world is when I'm in the shower and I have you know nothing around me except the water running. And that's where my brain somehow is able to free, uh, freely open up and think of ideas. And that's where I would say at least half, three fourths maybe of all the ideas of when I need to write something, that's where I get them. And so um, then the process that goes to taking that back downstairs or wherever I'm writing. And if, for me, the best, the most efficient way, and I was talking earlier about when I edit myself, you know, if you start off and you're writing your opening paragraph and you're going back and you're rewriting it and rewriting it, it can take forever. And so mm -hmm. what I try and do is just put everything possible down on that document, all the ideas, everything, where I want to go with it, where I want to end up and that sort of thing, and then rewrite around all of those ideas. That's the, the best way that I've found to be able to, to get everything done. And uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult process. For some people, writing is easy. It's like having a conversation. But for me, writing is writing is hard. And mm -hmm. uh, I was much better, much better at math in school than I was in English class. And uh, somehow or another, um, <laughs> I'm putting, I'm putting both of those actually to use. But uh, English and writing is just so much harder. I, I couldn't agree more about uh, being in that situation where just write what you want to write. Like, the, like writing an article isn't everything that you want to write. You have to have a lot of filler. You have to have those your know, transitions and how you introduce right. it and, and conclude and all that kind of stuff. Just write everything that you want. I mean, again, I, I agree with you, Steve. This is how it works for me is I just want to write the things I want to write. And if there's something you want to write and you have that moment, uh, that motivation right then, awesome. Use it, go take advantage of it, do that, get that down. And then you can fill in all the other stuff later. It, it I find it, um, I, I find it personally talking is different than writing. Um, where kind of when you have the engines going as you formulate a sentence, it's a different it's a different part than it is actually when you're just silent and writing on the keyboard. So I find it, I get that part done, and then I and then the beginning and end or whatever transitions I have trouble with, I just say it out loud and just say that sounds great, and that really gets that going for me. And I expand on that too, Nick. Um, when I have a conversation. If I'm on a podcast with Bobby, for instance, mm -hmm. and we're talking about something, he asks me about something, and I give him an honest answer, um, I may not have been thinking about that as a possible column topic, or I right. may not have known who I think you know is the best two-strike hitter in baseball or something like that, but then something just comes out sometime in the course of conversation. I think this is, you know, again, talking about write how you talk and have a conversation yes. with your reader um that sort of comes out and comes out of nowhere sometimes which you know like you said when when there's inspiration take it where it wherever yeah. it comes from and, exactly. and go with it so so steve when you when you have um i'm just imagining it's an afternoon and you have an article you need to write and you you can't clear your head do you just go and take a shower sometimes yeah Oh, that's fantastic. I, 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 I really do. You know, it doesn't matter what had happened earlier in the day. Uh, it, it, I get oh, to that great. point sometimes. And that's like, 
I got, you know, I, I might go, here's what I might, I might go out and, and run or something like that for a little bit. And then I get back home and I'm like, well, I have to take a shower now. So <laughs> it's, it's the excuse. Uh, well, a couple things really quickly. One, Craig, fantastic shirt. Um, <laughs> at first I thought it was about the KBO, but of course not. It's, it's about Ozzy Smith. <laughs> uh, <laughs> love that. Um, and, uh, and maybe Bobby will see the actual uh, St. Louis Cardinals underneath. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't purposely like. I don't really like the the Red Sox so much. So you know, I would really. I'll, I'll do it for you. Wait, it. who's your team? Are you a Mets fan? Oh God, come on! I want to be happy in life. Uh, I'm, I'm a Yankee <laughs> fan. Uh, please, please. Um, but uh, but anyway, so I. Oh, uh, much much better. Oh, yeah, is that better? That. All right, uh, great. There we go. I'm gonna the mic too. Uh, oh, now go. look at that. <laughs> Whatever. I'm, 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 it's just pitch count, guys. I. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I want to also go on the other side. We're talking about things that you should be doing, the, the process, how you generate it. What are some of the pitfalls you think? I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I think, from the outside uh, impressions of how you're supposed to do this. And I think that can trap a lot of writers that and kind of discourage them early. So uh, starting with you, Bobby, what would you suggest? I mean, what, what would you call some of those pitfalls? Fear. You can't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, you are going to write something that's just wrong and stupid and you have to correct yourself. You're going to write something that, um, you know, a lot of people read it and they're like, why did you word it in that way? You're never going to be a perfect writer. And if you're worried about being a perfect writer, you're never going to write period. As soon as you can get over that mountain, you're golden and you, you got to stay over it too. You can't return to that, that fear. And it's tempting every single time that I write, I don't want to start this article because what if it sucks? Um, maybe it will. Nice. Okay. Uh, how about you, Craig? You know, I, in that vein, you know, you, you have to, you have to, it's okay to, to, to be wrong. Um, and I think that if someone tells you something, there's sort of this defense mechanism you, you put up and, you know, you, you just assume that, you know, cause you're the one that put the work in, you know, and they're just trying to shoot you down or whatever. Right. But, uh, you know, you have to be able to separate the good criticism from the bad criticism because, uh, the good criticism is going to make you better. Um, and just assuming that everybody that's criticizing you is, uh, just a, an idiot or a moron isn't going to work. So I, I think that, you know, it, 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 it's okay to be wrong. Um, and it's okay to shut out a lot of the people who maybe are saying negative things, but um, you know, sometimes you, you have to pay attention uh, to, to a little bit of it to, to make sure that, that you're on the right path. And uh, one other thing that, you know, this is just, uh, you know, more general, but, you know, if you are going to be working with, with an editor, um, you know, and this is something that I'm not always particularly good at because, you know, I, I finish and then after the last period, you know, I say, OK, it's ready. Um, if you're going to be working with an editor, just really do your best to submit a clean, clean copy because um, yeah. um, the, they're going to enjoy reading your piece a lot more if they're not worrying about typos or grammatical errors or 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 that. And, and you know, you'll get more opportunities if um you know you you've you've read it through you know at least once after you finish to make sure that uh that to, to make sure it looks decent hey, i think those are great points uh steve how about you yeah i mean that's that says it all these guys uh, uh have hit the, all the things that i was thinking about you know just just learn from what you do and try and build on um your success and and learn from your failures essentially you know go back and as long as you go back and see did this work or did this not work? What can I do better? Um, I, I think you can improve and, and keep getting better. And that's, that's really all uh, you can really hope for. It's like that having helps. that closer mentality, right? We, we, Craig, you're talking about, you know, the people, there's a lot of trolls out there. When you write something, people are going to try to tear it down to lift themselves up. And I think you're exactly right. It's like chewing that watermelon and spitting out the bad seeds, right? Um, mm -hmm. We can all do that. It's just a matter of not letting it affect you personally. And something you have to realize when you're doing these, this writing is a lot of these people who are posting such negative remarks. Yeah, you're right. Some of them are productive. A lot of them, you go and look at every single comment that they've said, it's negative towards everyone. It's not anything personal. It's just who they are. Right. Yeah. My, my dad being my dad has uh, said to me about this, uh, son, there is a Turkish phrase for that. Uh, the dog barks. The caravan passes. 
<laughs> and uh, I was like, all right, I understand. I see. I see. The dog will always bark and it's always going to do that. It's not about you. And you will just yeah. keep going. And it doesn't matter what, how the dog barks. The caravan will continue. And I'd also um, say don't don't write for the people who are making the negative comments. Mm, right. Um, yep. um, yes. You know, the, you're, you might think like, oh, this is going to shut their point down. But it's not. Yeah. Just make sure that, that you're putting the best information and then the best writing you have forward uh without you know worrying about the most negative people you know certainly address the best you can the potential negatives or mm -hmm. the, the potential criticism when you're writing but uh make sure you're still writing for you know the the readers that you you want to read your pieces definitely and, and and kind of to that um it's a lot more i think in fantasy than it is in real baseball writing but nevertheless i i think it still applies is a lot of people kind of think that when they have, um, well, when they're writing that they have to be right. They're like, that is what their identity is. So I'm writing a fantasy baseball piece telling you this guy is good. And that's all that matters is that he actually turns out to be good. And I'm writing with that mentality. Uh, and that's all that people care about in the writing. You know, for example, if you're doing a take about firing Mike Matheny, uh, if you do that with the impression of, I know I'm right about it, and that's all that matters about the article. It's not going to come off in the way that you want. You know, it, it, it's a don't be a writer for the sake of being correct. Be a writer for the sake of the of writing, and make sure that your writing is has that entertainment to it. That is, you know, if you're in the business of hot takes, like you're, it's not a good investment. It's just this. This is so hard to do and be right all the time. If, if that's your focus, then it's just not going to go well for you. So don't make that the focus. Make that part of the, the story and the melody, but not the actual song itself. Yeah, and the, best, the best way to be right is to back it up. Yeah, it is It is great to be right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and admit when you are wrong. I think that's the other thing, yeah. too. I've had sure. so many times where I thought something, you know, I've, I really felt strongly about something, and it turned out, it was not the right to right side to be on and to be able to admit that and say, you know, I messed up. Okay. Let's see why. Um, mm -hmm. I think people certainly respect that in a writer, somebody that can do that rather than somebody who just keeps telling you that they're right all the time. Definitely. Um, and for the comments, no, I am not Turkish. My dad just knows those kinds of things. <laughs> I, but I, so another question I wanted to ask you guys is I'm sure all of you have, been in a position where you've received resumes and had to look over people and see like, okay, these are the kind of things I'm looking for and these kinds are not. And I imagine it's incredibly useful for people trying to get into this industry, like what you're looking for and what you're not uh, might even be even more important. So I want to start with Craig. I mean, I'm sure you went through this a lot with Viva Albertos, people that were going to write for the site or not. What kind of things were you looking for and what turned you away? You know, I think, um, you know, it's very important to get submit a writing sample right away um, so that you have something to read and make it so that, um, you know, everybody, when they write, you know, you're going to end up writing lists and things like that. But what I would be looking for was a deep dive into something, something that I couldn't find someplace mm. else. So I, I want to be taught something, um, you know, mm. and, and if that's something that, that you can do with, with, your writing sample, I think that's, that's the most important thing um, for me, you know, in terms of, you know, background, etc. You know, it's, it's great if you've, you know, written other places. And it's, it's generally important, if you can, to show that you're reliable in some way that, you know, you've, you can, you know, if you could submit, you know, three pieces a week, you know, maybe we'll only ask for one, but your ability to produce um at a certain level shows uh shows that you know you're you're keeping your brain working you're this and this is something that, that you're really interested in yeah oh, that's fantastic yeah how about you bobby so you remember in calculus those jerk teachers who are always like you got to show your work i want to see your work I, I want to see your process not your opinion mm. i want to understand why you came to this take why you're giving me this advice um, and I also want to see that you're receptive to receiving feedback because there's going to be feedback. And if you're not willing to work as part of the team and, uh, you know, and make the adjustments that are required, I don't especially want to work with you. I don't care about your audience. I don't care how many people have read your work before, what your site looks like. I want to read your work and see that you're a quality writer 
and a human being that I'm interested in hearing about. Yeah, I think that, I think that's great. I mean, really good point about the the audience itself. That's not actually what matters. What we're looking for is is a really good writer that we would personally enjoy. Um, and if you can't showcase that, that's a great thing. By the way, Miss Adaska, my calculus teacher, wonderful. Not a jerk <laughs> <laughs> at all. She was fantastic. So sweet, so nice, uh, and really just a fantastic teacher. So how dare you? Um, but, uh, and Steve, see what kind of advice would you give people? Love calculus. Love calculus. Great, great class. Um, uh, no, I, I think guys have, have hit on uh, all the important parts there. I mean, your your resume, sure, it looks good if you've worked with, with people that that the person that you're uh, submitting it to knows or is familiar with, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not a deal breaker. Um, and like Craig was saying, show me your work. Let's see. And, and Bobby too, saying the same thing. Uh, let's see what you can write. Um, see how you treat something. Uh, see your grammar, you know, God, got to have words spelled yeah. properly. Good grammar. I mean, that's, that's a, a, an essential. I'll tell you one real, real, real quick story. Um, ahead, about yeah, sometimes, you know, people solicit, um, you know, send things unsolicited to companies. I had a once many years ago, something crossed my desk about a guy that was just getting out of college and was looking for some freelance work. And I didn't really have any. Um, I was just starting out in, in doing fantasy stuff and it wasn't fantasy stuff. It was more sports writing related. But the words, you know, the piece that was submitted or what, what the writing samples that were submitted were really good. And so it struck me that this was, you know, some pretty decent work. I passed it along to uh, some folks in the baseball department that were higher up in the newspaper chain of command. Um, nothing ever came of it, but I remembered the guy's name and said, you know what? Wonder if he might turn out to be somebody, you know, if he might get a job in the industry sometime. That guy turned out to be John Morosi, uh, <laughs> who is now doing great things and uh, and is a very good writer, as a matter of fact. But you know, you just never know. His piece, you know, same sort of thing. I was impressed by it, and I passed it along to somebody else. Same thing could happen. You know, if you're trying to get started, and you're, you know, how many times uh, your, your odds are so small if you're sending something out unsolicited. But as as Matthew Barry has said before, and, and many other people, all you're looking for is the opportunity. You know, if you ever get that opportunity, you want to be ready for it and you want to put your best foot forward. Right. And I think that's the that's the most important thing. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's that, that's really important. I think it's it's very easy to say when I get to this level, then I'm going to do that or be that. And, exactly. and you have to, you have to be at that level before you get there. If mm -hmm. you're going to hit the ground running and succeed. Definitely. I mean, it's uh, like getting, getting the resumes for, you know, joining pitchers and everything like that, obviously a different process um, than you guys, but nevertheless, uh, I've gotten, I've gotten emails from people that give me like five samples, but they're all, very, you know, the, the writing of it, I didn't, it was all very basic stuff. It was all very just uh, step by step and there's no story to it. There's no br breath in it, no life uh, to it. And it's just, well, I don't want to read this. I don't care. I've gotten uh, um, someone just saying, I really love the site. How can I help? What can I do? And instead of just saying, well, you don't have any samples and you don't have any experience, I send them a, well, okay, here's a prompt, write this and how's it going to go? And they're fantastic. You know, Alex Fast sent me something. He had nothing. Just, he just wanted to be part of it. So I asked him to write a sample. Um, and, and he actually even first sent me his commissioners. Like he was a commissioner of his fantasy league. He would do a write up every week of just like it's 20 pages or something stupid about his own small fantasy league. Right. And I like this awesome. So many of these. I've gotten so many people replying. And I love it every time because that's a character. Like it takes a special person to put in that effort every single week. And that's a bigger showcase to me. Yeah. Um, and that, that has, and that's not just a textbook. It's like, and that was good writing. I know it was like really casual, but nevertheless, it was still interwoven with good writing. Uh, so that to me is a larger sign. And the fact that it's okay, give me a sample. And then the next morning he sent it back, even though I said, Hey, give it to me by the end of the week, next morning it's there that those things, even though we say, Hey, it's on Friday, it does give us an impact. You know, it does make a difference if you can show right away. So I want this, I can do this. I'm capable of it, and then it to be of quality. 
Um, that's really the major, uh, major things in my opinion. Anyway, guys, we are getting close to the top of the hour. So we have to sign off now. This has been fantastic. I really, really do appreciate all of you taking the time. I'm really sorry that Mike Gianella, uh, it, it, the technology wasn't really working his way. It would have been great to have him here as well. Uh, but maybe we can find something else for him to also still be part of PitchCon fully. But really, Bobby, Craig, Steve, thank you all so much uh, for being a part of this. Thank you. Give them all a follow. Read all their stuff. They're fantastic writers in the industry. Uh, you definitely, if you don't know them, you should now um, and definitely follow them. But really, guys, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, take care. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Nick.